Bindi. Welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I feel like, I mean, it's like obviously talking to an old friend and so easy. Um, but if I've been here like how many times, three, four times, I feel like this is like a, a normal <laughs> occasion for us. So thank you for having me. You know, Mindy, you're like, uh, we're like siblings. I feel like you're a sister. I'm right. A <laughs> we Agreed. Agreed. Keto siblings. Each other. We have so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, I, I believe this is the fifth time you've been on the podcast. If we're, count, oh, wow. if we're counting the challenge interviews that I've released as podcast, this is the fifth time. And wow. um, we always have so much fun. And today's episode is, is more so about your incredible book that by the time this episode is out, the book is out. So go get it. It's called Fast Like a Girl. And I was just telling you, Mindy, that I read the book uh, right before, well, I finished it before this conversation because I wanted to make sure I had notes. And I've read a lot of books on fasting. I've read a lot of books in general. And something I really love about this book specifically is that I could feel, I could hear your voice and passion just oozing through the pages. So I know mm -hmm. that like you put so much passion into it. And I, I know the backstory to this book. But also, you take the science that can be very overwhelming and complicated. And honestly, it stops people from make, taking action. You take that science and you share it, but then you give them actionable steps. And what does this mean? And how does what does this mean mm -hmm. for you? And why this might work for one person, but there's some nuances to it. So it's just a phenomenal book. I want to congratulate you on the Thank book. You. And I'm excited to chat with you about it today. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's funny the um, editor that I worked with to actually write the book. And then w there's there's been about five editors on this book, which is really cool because a well-edited book reads super smoothly. And the the woman that the first editor that helped me write it, she was kind of like a writing coach. Um, you know, I kept saying, you got to leave my voice in, you got to leave my voice in. I d and she was a little more dry and a little more um, like, let's just get the information and the science out there. And I'm like, no, we have to inspire people to really understand why this is such a cool tool. So I'm glad that came through. Yeah. I, I believe people get that and appreciate that. Whether it's consciously or subconsciously, there's an appreciation there. And you also have the uh, audio that will be out too. And Mindy read the audio book. And can we just say how tough it is to narrow Oh my God, it's so book? tough. How tough was that for you, Mindy? Yeah. You know what I realized is it's like acting. It's it when you read an audiobook, you have to read it with the tone. And it took me a little while. We actually went back and reread the beginning part again because it's it was just like acting. So I mean it was like I had to get the tone right. So that's a it's a big process. It is. Yeah. Congrats. I love authors that commit are so committed they read their own book. So kudos to you. And Believe me, Keto Campers, we're, we have a lot of ground to cover today. And before we get into the specifics of the books and some of the notes I have from your book, you mentioned to me before we hit record that one of your goals, and not just the book, but the work that you do, and I see this shine through you with every everything that you do, is bringing a feminine vibe back to health and why we have so much research on men. It's easy to do studies on men. But what about the women? What about the ladies? And yeah. what's the missing piece there? And could you share why that just is such a desire for you to get this back into the message of public health care? Yeah, it, you know, here's the thing is that the way that we've been doing health care is very linear. It's like you have this symptom, here's the diagnosis, here's the pill you take. And that doesn't work really well for anybody, but especially women, because our hormones are coming in and out in a 30-day period. Even for postmenopausal women, we have hormones that are, that are coming in and out, whereas men have hormones that are coming in and out in a 24-hour period. So it's almost like when I broke it down, I started seeing that healthcare has really, on so many levels, left women out. I'll give you an example. If a woman goes into a doctor's office and says, I'm depressed, the, the, the doctor typically is like, well, we need to get you on an antidepressant. We need to put you on a medication. The doctor doesn't say, why are you depressed? What is going on? And get to that root cause. I feel like that root cause is more of like a feminine thing. You know, women uh, often are overdoing things. They are working and carrying the load at home. Um, and they are really burning themselves out. And so if a woman walks into, the, into their doctor's office and they're depressed, why aren't we addressing the core root of depression? 
um, it's, it's something that I really am trying to emphasize that as women, we, we have this intuitive way about us. Um, we, our moods cycle with our hormones, our, so many things cycle with our hormone, hormones, cholesterol cycles with our hormones, glucose cycles with our hormones. So this linear approach doesn't work for us. And this is what I'm trying to bring back is not just the intuitive, but how, we, how do we look at a woman's menstrual cycle as something that needs to be factored into her health care? Well, Mindy, they're already taking care of that with, um, you know, in, in physical education class. I remember, you know, a male with his whistle talking about all of this, no? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I, you've heard me say this before, like we got the sex ed talk from the PE teacher with the like, sh you know, those shorts that are like baseball shorts that are cut off, whistle around his neck. Literally, that's the that was the talk that so many um, girls got in when they, you know, in the seventh and eighth grade when their periods start. Um, that's a crime. Like, you know, when a woman starts her period, there's a, there should, it's sacred and we should be, um, helping her understand that lifestyle changes work really well if she maps them out to her menstrual cycle, but nobody's, nobody's talking about it. It's back to the one size fits all. And, and I'll give you an example. Women, I'm sure they've, um, seen this, that, that women often, bitch the week before their cycle they'll say i'm craving carbs i'm craving chocolate i don't feel like going anywhere and so you know we villainize that but do you know that there's a reason behind that mm -hmm. like you know the carbs you create carbs because progesterone needs more glucose you create chocolate because magnesium chocolate's packed with magnesium and that can help me uh, uh progesterone you feel like you want to be inner because progesterone stimulates GABA and so it goes into the GABA receptor sites, so you're a lot calmer. But we don't we don't talk about that. We don't honor that. And that's what I'm trying to change. So yes, there's a huge gap in in women's health, and uh, you're doing a great job filling that gap. So let's talk about your book, Fast Like a Girl, a women's guide to using the healing power of fasting to burn fat, boost energy, and balance hormones. I think we all want that, even for guys. Yes. <laughs> so, something that I that I have here in my notes um, is a, st a statistic that you wrote in your introduction, and I'm just going to read it, and then I want to hear your thoughts on why mm -hmm. you believe this is the case. Here's here's what I what I took from your book. Recently, the Centers of Disease Control for Disease and Control Prevention published that 60% of Americans have one chronic disease, 40% have two or more, and 90% of the trillions of dollars we spend on healthcare goes to treating these conditions, which is kind of what you said with the depression part. So yep. why are we so sick, Mindy? What are the the main themes that you've seen? Well, I mean, there's so many reasons we could point to food, we can point to, uh, you know, mo modern toxicity. Um, but if we really boil it down, I think there's two reasons why we are so sick right now. Um, one, we are in an evolutionary mismatch, especially women. Like, let's just take the woman who's 47 years old and is like working all the time, high stress job. Maybe she comes home, has teenagers at home. Um, and her, so her stress level, level her pace is um, really amplified and intense. And then on top of that, she's eating food that is packed with toxicity and she's eating food all day long. So if you look at women in general, this is, you know, men, both men and women, but it's really destroying women more than men because this is working against our hormonal cycle. The other thing, I put this in the book, and this is something I found when I was researching, and I really like this concept. And the concept is that there was, back in the cave person day, there was something called the thrifty gene hypothesis. Have you heard of that? You know, vaguely, I kind of remember that, but uh, not not too much. Please explain it. Yeah. So the idea is that the the people that were able to survive long periods without food had back in the primal days had a very specific gene, and this gene allowed them to move into ketosis much quicker. And so when the sugar went down, they could switch over into this fat adapted place. And once they were in the fat adapted place, they started making ketones, which supercharged them. 
So the only, the, the people who came out of that primal time are the ones that had that gene. Everybody else that didn't make it through that primal time didn't have that genetic expression. That's mm -hmm. a, that's the hype. That's why it's called a hypothesis. We don't, yeah. we don't fully know, but, um, it's interesting because I started when I stumbled upon that, I started thinking, oh my God, like we are going against our evolutionary mismatch or against our genetic expression. Like we are not living in accordance with what our genes are wanting us to do. And one of the things that we know about diabetes, metabolic syndrome, want part of the theory of this um, uh, thrifty gene hypothesis is that you, the people who are getting metabolic syndrome are the ones that are eating all day, that keep blood sugar really high. They don't go more than eight hours without food. Um, and so they're going against their genetic expression and that's what's causing chronic disease. And mm. when you think about that, that's pretty profound. It is. It is. Uh, you're right. So evol evolutionary mismatch, especially for women and then going against your genetic expression. And that thrifty gene hypothesis makes total sense to me because if you think me about too. it, if, if your ancestors didn't have that ability to burn fat and produce ketones, yeah. How could you survive? You you wouldn't right. have any energy to the brain. You wouldn't be able to hunt and focus and kill. You would just die. So it makes sense yep. that they didn't survive. So thank God for ketones, huh? Right. Thank God for ketones. I mean, ketones are, were there for survival. So if think about today, if we're not do, fat adapted, if we're not a accessing the ketogenic energy system, we're we're not using a necessary fuel source and that is what why i think so many people have gotten great results with the keto diet so many people have gotten great results with fasting because they have been accessing um a fuel source that um is rarely accessed let's stay on this topic you know uh, of of uh, what you call metabolic switching i know mindy you love ketosis as a as a tool i do too and we say as a tool not the tool meaning it's one of many tools so what are, in, in your book, you have a whole chapter on, on metabolic switching and, and the power of it. You talk about the ketobiotic diet. What, what do you love about it? Like, what are some of the main principles that most people could benefit from this metabolic switching? Yeah, it's, it's funny. We've been, you know, the more I study fasting, the more I study metabolic switching, the more I realize we have gotten the diet culture all wrong. Mm. Uh, the fact that we think there's one diet to help us lose weight, one diet to keep us healthy. So, you know, that's erroneous and um, even for men. So with metabolic switching, you and I have seen this quite a bit when we are working with, with clients is that you put somebody in a fasted state, the body heals. You put them back into a fed state, raising their glucose, that you switch back into another fuel source that gives the body nutrition to, to power up and, and, um, and get the necessary antioxidants into the cell, get necessary nutrients to the mitochondria. You switch back. Now you're, go, you're, you're supercharging yourself with ketones, which is also a fuel source for the, the mitochondria. And it's the constant in and out that's the key. In fact, it was funny because when I wrote the book, um, the editor was like, okay, tell me about this chapter. Like, um, is it necessary? And I was like, yes, it's necessary. Um, it's probably the, one of the more pivotal parts of how a, a, a woman should fast. And if you want to lose weight, it's the in and out to your point, to Keto Flex's point, it's the in and out that creates the healing. But we are, we are looking for absolutes in healthcare. We look for one way, one yeah. fast, one supplement, one workout, um, one, you know, one style of eating. But the human body doesn't respond well to that. The human body responds well to the constant switching in and out of these two fuel sources and to a little bit of hormetic stress that causes the body to have to um, be um, put itself into an adverse situation so it can make itself stronger. Yeah. And I want to talk more about that, but here, here, I always get this from people. Oh, I've done keto before. And I'm sure you've get that with, fa I've done fasting before, but please, I want everybody to understand there are thousands of ways to do keto and thousands of ways to do yeah. fasting. The way that Mindy teaches fasting and metabolic switching going in and out of ketosis, it's different than any other person who teaches it. Honestly, it's a very different approach. So if you've tried intermittent fasting or keto in the past, please be open to trying it the way that we teach it and the way we're going to explain it today. Yeah. And when it comes to ketosis, 
it makes sense to me just from studying our ancestors that our ancestors did keto not because they chose to you know be in this keto camp but because they either had only fat and protein available so naturally they were burning body fat and they were in ketosis or they practice fasting because there was no food, but they didn't do it forever. They didn't find fruit and carbs and say, we don't eat that. We are in the keto camp. They would eat right. it, right? They would, they would metabolically switch flex out. But also if you think about what are you sending to your body in terms of if you've been in ketosis for two years and you're excessively doing OMAD, that one meal a day, what are, what are you signaling to your body in terms of what is the environment? What is the status of the environment? Could you explain that? Like if somebody is in this constant survival state, because if you're fasting so much and being in ketosis for too, too long, what kind of signals are you sending to your body that you're in and when it comes to the, the environment? Does that make sense that I asked that? Yeah. Right yeah. I think, I think what we have to, the best way to explain this is what happened on my YouTube channel when I first started to explain metabolic switching. Um, mm -hmm. We had, you know, when Jason Fung's book came out, The Obesity Code, everybody started losing massive weight. He was, you know, he really credited with the one that said, gosh, you know what? Like we, when we go into a fasted state, we go and find that stored glucose that we stored years ago. And hats off to him for discovering that. But what, what I found was so many people that were doing one meal a day landed on my YouTube channel. And what they, the reports that they gave were, my hair is falling out, I'm gaining weight now, um, I have brain fog, um, I, I, I don't, I'm getting a rash, like all the adverse symptoms of, the key, of fasting and the ketogenic diet. And so then all of a sudden that you know, the ketogenic diet and fasting became villainized. And what we have to do, again, I'm going to go back. Anytime we're looking for absolutes in healthcare, we lose. So it wasn't that OMAD was the problem. It was that these, I call them OMADers, these mm -hmm. OMADers were never switching in and out. They were doing one meal a day over and over and over again. So eventually the body went, hey, you know what? We are, we don't know when food's coming in. There's a lot of scarcity here. So we better hold on to fat. We better raise glucose. Um, we better push toxins out. So it's really, that became a perfect example of where the world wasn't metabolically switching. And yeah. um, I know you saw the same thing in your social media. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, you're, you're, Mindy's not opposed to OMAD. I'm not opposed to OMAD. I'm not unless, opposed. No. Yeah. Unless you do it excessively. That's the thing. That's right. So, you mentioned hormesis, right? Finding that hormetic zone. Maybe you could speak a little bit more about that and how it's so unique to that person. But if we could teach people to stay in that hormetic zone, they're going to know exactly what they should do. So could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. You know, the best way to look at this, we totally get this when it comes to exercise. You know, if I went to my trainer and she gave me the same workout all the time, when she first gave me that workout, I'd probably see some change. But then after a while, I'm going to get plateau because there's not enough stress on my body to build itself stronger. So it's really interesting. I feel like we've gotten programmed for comfort and it's really destroying us uh, in this modern world. The idea is not comfort. And anybody who works out a lot knows this. Anybody who's trained for a marathon knows this, that you've got to push right to that edge so that the body adapts and builds itself stronger. Um, I always use the example of of like when we went, the pandemic first happened. Um, it was really interesting because in our town, the first six weeks, remember everybody was like trying to flatten the curve. And the first six weeks, people were like outside riding their bike. We stood, we we would sit on our porch and in a, in a rocking chair and say hello to all our neighbors. And there was something beautiful about it because we had never seen people who were, you know, working from home like this and needing to go out. But then we went 12 weeks, two years, and it got harder and harder and, and pe less people came out. Uh, people were more angry. People were frustrated. A lot of fighting went on. And that's because we just stayed in it way too long. So it's the same thing when you're fasting or you're in keto. Um, if you stay in it too long, you will get stuck. And for women, even more so. Uh, that's such a great example. You know, in your book, you talk about fasting to reset dopamine pathways. And I think in this day and age, understanding 
that we have a dopamine resistance problem yeah. and having some solutions to it is, is key. So maybe you could dive deep into some of the things you wrote about in the book when it comes to this issue with dopamine and how fasting could help to kind of deal with that problem we're, we're facing. Yeah, this was something I found um, in the research looking for, for my YouTube videos years ago, was that there were a couple of different studies showing that when people went into a 48-hour fast, and this fast was actually a controlled fast, so they were checked into a hospital, um, they only drank water, so they really monitored what would come in, the stimulation of outside dopamine sources were monitored. And what they found was that at the 48th hour, that the whole dopamine system, that whole pathway got re, would reboot and make itself stronger. That's and super cool. Wow. super cool, right? And D2, new D2 receptor sites were wow. created. So what, you what know, is that? What's so dopamine receptor dopamine, sites? Yeah, dopamine, yeah. Dopamine two receptors. That is so, so cool. Isn't that cool? So I decided yeah. to try it with, I mean, it's been fun because we have this huge sample group on YouTube. So I was like, let's try this, everybody. Let's see what happens with the 48-hour fast. This was about five years ago. And people reported back. They were like, oh my God, like depression gone, anxiety gone, like wow. after the fast. So because it reset that whole system. So I think it's it's not one that's that's talked about enough, but I definitely wanted to put it in there because we def we definitely have a mental health issue. We do. So it's 48 hours that they studied in that, in that uh, yeah. study for, and, and that was a human, that was a human study. Yeah. There you yeah. go. And then were they doing anything else? Like what were they doing for 48 hours besides not eating? They were, it was a controlled hospital setting. So I think they were laying in the, in their, in a bed which could have been another, you know, to, to um, the theory that the way we reboot um, dopamine is by boredom. So there right. could have been a little <laughs> bit of that, but there was multiple studies and I, I, I lay them all out and, and cite them in the book. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, hey, that's another benefit to fasting, right? right? It's like yeah. And we get, and you know, here's the thing I would say about studies that I really want to point out. Um, we are science addicted right now. And every anything that's science related, we go, oh my God, this is incredible because we have a study on it. You know, people like Huberman is a great example of that. But you know what? I want to say that science gets us in the ballpark and then we need to apply it and see what works for ourselves. Mm. So I don't let science totally dictate what we I do with my patients. I let science give me an insight and then we practice it uh, with my patients. And in this setting, we could practice it with hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, that's been the really cool thing about my social media. Um, we started doing these fast training weeks and I would say to people, let's practice this and give me feedback. And like thousands of comments of people saying happy for weeks, happy for months, cured mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And so much of that is because we rebooted the dopamine system. I, what you just said is so important. I, I really hope the audience got what you just said because there's some brilliant people out there. Huberman is one of them, Peter Tia, and we, we respect them. No disrespect at all. Yeah. We love what they do. It's so important. That's one piece of the puzzle. What happens when you apply it with 10 yeah. people, 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, it could be a different story. And to your That's point, right. it's usually is, it usually is a different story. And I do the same thing with my academy students. It's like, this is what it's saying. Hey, let's try this with a group of you. Give me some feedback. And maybe, yeah, it matches. This is actually the, how it works. Or maybe it's the complete opposite, but it isn't until you apply it. So please, when you're hearing these amazing people share these research studies, apply it or, or maybe do it with the group and see how it goes. So many, I love that you're talking about that yeah. because it kind of goes over people's heads when they just yeah. hear the science. I, I, get, I don't know if you get this, but I get um, comments on my social a lot that, hey, what do you think about what this person said? And yeah. what do you think about what this person said? And what do you think of this study? And I, I get as the consumer, it's really confusing. But I want to remind everybody that you know we're, the beauty of social media is we can educate ourselves. Um, and it's not an absolute. So when you hear somebody say, this study was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Now you try it on. And what we find is that, it, you know, if you try it on, it didn't work for you. 
especially with women, we start to, there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame. Didn't work for me. I must've done something wrong. And is it possible that it just wasn't the right type of fast, length fast, length food for you? I mean, our microbiome controls our blood sugar level. We all have different microbiomes. So we've really got to get out of this, this study obsession and use them just as guiding lights. Are you looking to follow the ketogenic diet, but you're unsure how to get started? I'm going to be hosting a free seven day keto kickstart challenge where I'm going to be teaching you our four pillar framework to mastering the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. You know, in this four pillar framework, I've taught thousands of people how to achieve amazing weight loss, reduce inflammation, and get rid of all the symptoms they were experiencing. Whether it's Jasmine, Diana, David, or Sander, so many people have achieved their health goals by doing exactly what you're gonna learn in this free seven day keto kickstart challenge. This is really the information that I wish I had back when I was starting my health journey. When I was obese as a 24 year old, if I had this challenge, it would have put me in the right direction right from the start. I mean, can you relate to going on Dr. Google, looking for strategies for weight loss, for health, for energy, how to get better sleep? Ugh, it could be such a strenuous process. Not knowing which foods to eat, what are the best foods for energy, for fat loss, for vitality, how to pair fasting with keto, and how to do it for results that you see right off the bat. And that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about on this free seven day keto kickstart challenge. So I hope you can join to learn this four pillar framework from myself and the Keto Camp team, which is something we normally sell for over $3,000, but you can get access to this four pillar framework for absolutely free. These are the exact strategies you need to make this year your healthiest and best year yet. So click around this video, visit the website, and I can't wait to see you on this seven day keto kickstart challenge. Yeah, so important. I love that you brought that up. Good job, Mindy. Uh, question about, let's, let's get into now uh, women who have a menstrual cycle. And the book is not just for women who have a menstrual cycle. You have a whole bunch of research and, and information on the postmenopausal women too. But let's start with the, men, the menstruating women out there. Power phase, manifestation power phase, and nurture phase. I love how you explain that. You have graphics and charts, and you show exactly what's happening at a hormonal level. Uh, so please share those different stages or phases during a woman's cycle. Yeah, you know, the, I think the best place to start it with that conversation is what happened to me when I started fasting. And <laughs> yeah, I love right? that story, please. <laughs> it was like I was like 45 and I was just fasting all the time. And then I did a Dutch test on my hormones and my hormones co were completely tanked. They were lower than a postmenopausal woman. And I was having some, you know, pretty uh, severe menopause symptoms. Um, and I was discovering that if I cycled in and out of fasting, that it, it really helped those menopause symptoms. So what I did is I started looking at estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And I was like, okay, what are the needs of these hormones? And it's really fascinating. So for example, progesterone, it needs more glucose. So you don't want to be in keto. You don't want to be fasting. You want to raise glucose. Well, that happens right the week before your period. Um, estrogen does really well, cleans up per act when you do keto and fasting. If you keep blood sugar down, insulin down, you can maximize good estrogen. Um, so you want to, in the front half of your cycle, lean more into the longer fast and more into keto. And then testosterone really needs to be broken down by the gut. So when we look at what happens during ovulation, we've got to really work on the microbiome, work on the liver, and we don't want to go into too deep of ketosis. Just a little bit is good. So I started to apply that to myself and my cycle. Like I thought I was going into menopause. Mm -hmm. And then once I figured those three things out, I like my cycle came back and I'm 53 and I still have a cycle. And at 45, I thought I was going into menopause. So wow. I totally cleaned it up by working with my hormones, which ultimately is the best because estrogen is cardioprotective. It's neuro, um, you know, neurologically protective for the brain. So you want, as a woman going through menopause, you really want to keep those hormones at their, at their best. So, yeah, and then, yeah. and then what I did is I, I don't know about you, but all of the follicular luteal, like, I was like, this is boring. Um, we need to make <laughs> totally, this more yeah. fun. 
And everybody's tripping up on the words. So I decided that we would create power phases where you could power up on fasting and keto. And then during ovulation, I call it the manifestation phase where you can manifest anything you want. But did you know, not only do you manifest a baby, but you can manifest a new job. You can resolve conflict. You have some serious hormonal superpowers. And then the nurture phase at the back half, the week before your period, I call it the nurture phase because women need to nurture themselves. When progesterone goes high, when cortisol goes high, progesterone gets shy. And so she won't come out when cortisol is high or when glucose is low. So there's a whole different strategy. And once I figured it out for myself, then I, again, went to hundreds of thousands of women and applied it and saw that the, it was a tried and true um, uh, scenario. And we turned it into something called the fasting cycle. Uh, it's in the book. We map it out. We've even created an app where you can go and you can pl plug in like what day of your cycle you're on. Um, and it'll tell you what fast and what foods you can, you should do. So brilliant. I, I, I love that. Is that app going to be available by the time the book is out or? Yeah, it'll, it's going to, the first rendition will come out with the book. Uh, it will be a free app. Um, and then we're going to work on timing exercise, timing supplements, um, timing everything to a woman's cycle. So you would just look at, oh, it's day 10. So here's the lifestyle I should live. And you'll get a little message on the front of your, of your screen saying, is it called fast like a girl do. app? Is that the, the name of the app? Yeah. Fast like a girl. Yep. Fast there like a girl. Go. By the time this is out, the, the, the app will be out too. That's yep. brilliant. I, 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 it's so, you know, the way that you explain it. It's easy to remember, right? When cortisol is high, progesterone is shy. Yeah, that right. makes sense, right? And it's like that. I'm always going to remember that now for the rest of my life. I think the audience will as well. So right? that's kind of like the way you wrote the book. It's really catchy terms that sticks. Um, I'd love for you to speak a little bit more about estrogen because um, there's a lot of things I've learned from you in regards to estrogen and how it communicates with um, receptor sites in the brain and how it's responsible for like the way you think and, and how yeah. it could, you know, brain fog could be linked to estrogen uh, dominance or not enough estrogen. So I'd love for you to little, go a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, it's such a good question. So estrogen, we have different types of estrogen. And th this is what I really want to point out, um, that you have good estrogen and you have bad estrogen. And we have villainized estrogen. We assume that all estrogen is bad. But good estrogen, estradiol, will actually go into serotonin receptor sites and start to initiate happiness in serotonin production, just like wow. progesterone goes into GABA and calms you. So when we start to lose estradiol in our 40s and 50s, depression is very common because we're not getting that stimulation of serotonin. So I think that that's the most important thing to know is that it really, estrogen really affects your moods. But the, the other thing and the, to know is that it's not just one type of estrogen, it's multiple types of estrogen. So we can't villainize estrogen. There are bad estrogens that will prov make you, ha you know, can cause cancer. Um, and you know, this is why I'm a fan of Dutch, the Dutch test. So we can know what it is that you need to do, um, what type of estrogen you're making, but you can't just look at total estrogen. I had a, um, a, a lab that I was looking at from a patient's mother the other day. And when I looked at the lab, they were like, oh my gosh, they were, she had had breast cancer and the dad was really concerned because estrogen was going really high. And when I looked at the lab, I said, well, we don't know what type of estrogen is going really high. What if the protective estrogen is going really high? And we don't know if the liver and the gut are breaking down estrogen. What if we need to, you know, there needs to be some support for those organs to break estrogen down. So we, we have to remember that just because you make a hormone doesn't mean you use a hormone. So mm -hmm. you've got to metabolize it. You have to break it down. And with estrogen, there's really three types that we have to keep in mind. Yeah. And the Dutch test shows you those three types and it shows you the pathway it's going, how much percentage wise is going down a certain pathway. Um, we love the Dutch test. Uh, you're right. Yeah. Because just doing a total estradiol or estrogen is not on a lab report. It's not going to give you everything you want to know. So, so fascinating. The different roles of estrogen. I'm just always blown away by that. Right. It, 
Yeah, it's so cool. And we Go don't, you, you know, um, I was speaking to a bunch of doctors this summer and I, well, the first thing I asked was, how many of you um, feel like you have a good handle on hormones? And there were 1,200 doctors in the room and only one of them raised their hand. Wow. And I'm like, okay. And I, I like lost it. I was like, this is a problem. We need to understand our hormones. And then uh, about a month ago, I was in a car with a 55-year-old and a 38-year-old and a man, and we were talking about the different hormones. And um, the man was like, you know, I didn't really know when my wife's hormones come in and out, but it, it seems like it would be helpful if her, it changes her personality. And then the, the two women were like, the 55-year-old was like, I'm 55. And I don't really understand my hormones. And the 38-year-old was like, I have no clue. So we have a hormonal literacy problem, but then we start villainizing, you know, the, your, your cycle is not good. Let's put you on a birth control. Um, we start villainizing the symptoms that women get from an imbalance in their cycle. But it, it's, it's, the root of that is ignorance. And we need to really bring the knowledge of hormones back to the world. Yeah, yeah, so true. And your book is doing that. We need to get this book fast like a girl in every teenage girl's hands. Like, yes, in order that's to graduate. My, yeah, school. that's my vision. Is how do we treat the? How do we teach the teenage girls? Yeah, I haven't quite figured that out yet. But you know, that's we got to go to the younger girls. They're they are definitely under physical, emotional, and chemical stress, and they have no clue. I would say though, um, like my son is in college and. We were at like family day or family week and one of his friends who's a, a, a woman was sitting next to me and I asked her, do you track your cycle? And she's like, yeah, I do. So I do think the younger generation is, wow. is tracking their cycle more than women in my age group did. Yeah, well, they might follow you, Mindy, on TikTok. That's probably why. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I was like, so I was so excited for this young woman. I was like, oh my God, you do? That's amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. And, um, and it's just, that's, we, we have to bring the language of hormones back to everything we do because it controls our moods. It controls our energy. It controls our sleep. It controls how we gain weight and lose weight. I mean, everything. Men too, but men only have testosterone driving them. Women have estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone driving them. Yeah, a good point. Fair point. I can't argue yeah. that, Mindy. You, you, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk about uh, menopausal ladies out there because I always get, when we do these conversations, I always get a comment because we always start with the menstruating women and then we move on to the postmenopausal women. But so many <laughs> postmenopausal women are watching and they're like, what about us? I'm like, keep watching the interview. <laughs> we'll get to it. Right. So here for you. We're not going to forget about you. Mindy will never do that. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about them. You know, I know you, you've explained this in the past, but what is, um, what is some of the research and information you put in this book in regards to menopausal women? Well, what I did for the postmenopausal women is I created a 30 day fasting reset where she, a woman can go through a 30 day period and make sure that she's nurturing every single hormone, but mm. not time it to a cycle. Women who have a cycle, they will start this fasting reset on the day of their cycle. So for example, if you're on day nine, when you start the fasting reset, you will, you will start it on day nine if, you're on that, if that's your cycle, whereas a, a menopausal woman will just start on day one and go all the way through. And what we found with this reset, it's something I use clinically, um, that it really balances a postmenopausal woman's hormones out. And one of the things that I, shocked me was how many postmenopausal women can't lose weight, still have hot flashes, have a lot of mental stress, um, can't don't have cognitive um, abilities, losing memory, and so you know I, I wrote the menopause reset, which was five things you should do after forty lifestyle things, and so this takes it to another level where now you can go through a thirty day period and really clean up your metabolic system. So there's, I sprinkled a lot of that in there. Um, it, you know, I think the other thing about menopausal women is that we need to get to know the characteristics of our hormones. So this is what I do as a perimenopausal woman that doesn't really know when my hormones are coming or going is that if I have a uh, problem focusing, I know I might be low in estrogen. If my skin is really dry, then I might be low in estrogen. 
if I'm really hungry um, or having trouble sleeping, it might be that I need to nurture uh, progesterone. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the book, I talk about that, that it's really about knowing these hormones and most women don't know them. So we we have to start with um, what are they, what are their personalities, and now how do you fast and eat to, to maximize them? It's so good. I love that you're teaching them just with intuition, right? Dry skin, hungry, yeah. um, tired, what, what that means, just an understanding that from a hormonal standpoint. It's even more complicated or more challenging, I should say, because a woman who's postmenopausal might have a male doctor who's 60 or 70 years old teaching her what to do about postmenopause. Uh, being menopausal and having these symptoms. And they, they usually just say, Mindy, it's just part of it, right? You just deal yeah. with it. Like, what are your thoughts on those type yeah, of problems? Yeah, you know, this is what, I, I mean, I applaud the men that are in the hormone field, um, but it's really challenging for me to understand advice from a man because a man's not living the ebbs and flows of, of their menstrual cycle. So just like I would never comment on, ED, you know, I don't know what that's like. I don't know what an erection is like. Like I have, you know, I can tell you hormonally what I think it is, but I don't, I don't really know what that feels like. So I feel like the same thing for, for when men are giving a lot of advice to women is that there's knowledge, there's science, then there's the knowledge of how to work with your hormones. And then there's embodying the actual flow with your hormones. And when right now so much has been led by men, even like I'm watching so many podcasts right now where they're bringing male hormone experts on. And and this is not this is not to diss men, it's just to say, hey, you know, I appreciate you stepping into the hormonal field. Now, you know, let's chat with the 53-year-old docs that are living this, that have played with these pieces. Um, and that's what I'm trying to provide. It's fair. Uh, uh, totally fair. In, in your book, you also have a section, uh, fasting in specific conditions. And there's a whole, I, I love how you touched upon every kind of concern or question you've probably gotten over your YouTube channel over the years. And I want to touch upon a, a couple of them that I've seen often with my community. Um, fasting and hair loss is one of them, right? I, I've heard people say I've done, I did fasting and I did OMAD and it caused hair loss. What, what was happening there? Yeah. Two things. One, um, when you fast longer than 17 hours, you can stimulate something called apoptosis where the cell actually dies because it's such a dysfunctional cell. And in that death, um, heavy metals, plastics, glyphosate can be released into the body and can uh, start to cause hair loss, can start to cause brain fog, can start to cause weight gain. It's the release of these chemicals when you stimulate apoptosis. So in the book, I talk about how we need to open up the detox pathways. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing that I'm really seeing more and more in my community is that we have a mineral deficiency. We have an amino acid deficiency. And you need minerals and you need aminos to make hormones, uh, including thyroid hormone. So if you go into a fasted state and you're already depleted in minerals and aminos, you may notice that your hormone, that your hair, you start to lose your hair. So start by adding aminos back in, start by adding minerals back in. And then if it continues, you're going to need to look at your toxic load. It's so good. I love that. What about somebody who fasts, but they actually feel fatigued and tired when they fast? Yeah. So fasting is a healing, healing mechanism. So, um, what you're doing is you're making ketones to be able to power up mitochondria. So the mitochondria make energy. So if your ketones are, if if your mitochondria are really sick, and you throw a bunch of ketones at it, it may take some time for that energy to really kick in. So um, I think it's more a sign of your mitochondrial health. You know, one of the conversations I had with Dr. Nasha Winters years ago was um, she said that one of the signs of poor metabolic health is that you can't go without food. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, in this journey that I've been on, I'm like, that's exactly right. I mean, when I started fasting, I couldn't go long periods without food. And now it's just as effortless. And my energy is also really, really good. 
So I think there is something um, to that as far as the mitochondria goes. We need to know um, that it's the mitochondria that makes energy. And if you're losing energy while fasting, you have a sick mitochondria. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I've seen just supplementation with L-carnitine help, you know, short term mm, with that. But excellent. of course, you want to go upstream and see what's happening there. But yeah, such an important point. And maybe um, that might happen in the beginning too, as the body's adapting. But if it continues to happen, like you said, it's a mitochondrial issue. You got to figure out what's damaging that mitochondria. Yeah, exactly. What about fasting and supplements? I get that question a lot. What are the, the, the green, green lights and what are the red <laughs> lights? So with supplements, you know, you always have to ask what you're trying to accomplish with a fast. So if you're trying to accomplish the um, getting your, your body into this accelerated healing state uh, where the body can figure out what it needs to heal, then actually supplements can be a distraction. You're, you're manipulating the intelligence, especially if you go over 50, uh, 24 hours uh, with a fast. So anything over 24 hours, I say, leave out the, the supplements. Um, now, having said that, a lot of people like to go into these longer fasts pretty regularly. So if, that, if you need to take your supplements, you know, just keep them within the less than 24-hour period because after 24 hours, you're going to hit this incredible innate intelligence marker where the body is, is, is healing and we don't want to mess with that. The intelligence knows what to do. And when we start throwing uh, supplements at it, we, we mess with the intelligence. A, a good example and something that we've talked a lot about um, is amino acids and autophagy. So what, you know, does, if you take amino acids in your fasting window, does it pull you out of autophagy? So I asked Minkoff that and he yeah. doesn't, th yeah, he doesn't think so. Is that he, what he, he told you? He doesn't. Yeah. He said the same thing, but I, you know, it's funny because I just got asked this question on my live stream earlier today I'm, and I said, Minkoff said he didn't, thinks it doesn't, but I'm not, I want to hear your thoughts. I said, I'm not so convinced. I think it's still a good idea to take your amino acids with your meals. What, what do you think? Well, you know, you have to look at what autophagy is. Autophagy is a glucose sensor system. So when glucose goes down, it for a certain period of time, it triggers autophagy. But it's also a nutrient sensor system. So if you're adding aminos in specifically, that's the same nutrient you get in protein. And we know that protein can pull you out of autophagy. So I always say, you know, it can really help. Aminos can really help in your fasting window. So if you're not trying to, um, if you're not trying to stimulate autophagy and, and every week, every day of the week, you're not, you know, it's not like the goal is autophagy all the time. Yeah. Then you might put some aminos in your, in your fasting window periodically. Yeah, great. I, and I agree. You know, that makes total sense to me. And if you're exercising in a fasted state, then hey, aminos could also be a great tool for you as well. Yeah. What about <clears throat> eating disorders? Um, somebody mm. who has either an active eating disorder or a history of an eating disorder, how, what are some of the precautions they should take with fasting? Yeah, I'm super happy you asked this because this was a big discussion when we put the principles of the book together. We wanted to make sure we address this. And um, with eating disorders, you definitely need to work with a health coach or your psychologist who understands fasting. And so um, what we have found is that a lot of the psychologists only see the negative of fasting but I've seen fasting change the relationship of uh, somebody's relationship to food. So um, I, I would say don't go at it if you don't have a doctor or a health coach working with you um, or a psychologist. It, it could trigger some, some um, old patterns. Uh, and having said that, I've seen some incredible miracles when people involve their doctor and, and they change their relationship to food. It's really profound. Well said. I love that. One of my favorite parts of your book came when you were talking about the importance of relationships with health and happiness. And I'm such a believer in that. And one of the things I have here in my notes, I'm going to read it because I'm sure you don't remember everything you wrote. So I'm going <laughs> to read it for you, Mindy. I'll do Thank the you. favor. <laughs> Thank you. Here's what you said. One of the longest studies ever done on health and happiness proved that positive relationships matter for our health. Harvard University launched an 80-year study studying starting in 1938 and ending in 2018. 
tracking 268 Harvard graduates and more than 1,300 of their grandchildren, hoping to see trends of what built a healthy and happy life. The conclusion, trending to tending to your relationships matters most to your health. According to the researchers, these findings show that tending to your relationships is a form of self-care. Subjects who maintain warm relationships live longer, happier, healthier lives. Could you talk yeah. a little bit more about that? Yeah. And this, there was one thing that I really wanted to include, include in the book, and we're seeing it on social media and in my Reset Academy, is that fasting specifically is done best when in, done in a community. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have, and you, I'm sure your keto camp's the same way. Like we have, you know, people from all over the world popping on a Zoom call, cheering each other on, supporting each other in the fasting lifestyle. And it just warms my heart because it's so profound what that community support will do. And, you know, coming out when I wrote this, um, it was 21. So 2021, we were just coming out of the pandemic. And um, I really felt like we needed to bring community back, that we can't lose sight that connection and community is really important for our health. And I think what in this workaholic sort of mentality, we forget that when you're connecting to people, you really are lifting up oxytocin. And when you lift up oxytocin, you start to regulate cortisol. And regulating cortisol helps insulin. And if you regulate insulin, you can regulate your sex hormones. So oxytocin is at the top. And yet, you know, back to the feminine piece of healthcare, we don't give connection and community enough credit. And that study that I quoted was done on men, um, but it was Harvard graduates that they looked over decades and they found that the real key to health and happiness was quality of your marriage. So how um, strong your marriage was, quality of friendships, um, that that really played a key part. And it's the longest study done on happiness. Yeah. So we, we always want the quick fix. We want the best diet. We want the best fast but we can't lose sight of the importance of community. So important. Um, I, I love that you put that in the book and you were referring to that. Um, what do you call it? The hormone hierarchy. Is that what you call it? Yeah. The, the hormone yeah. hierarchy. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Oxytocin, yeah. cortisol, and insulin, and then other hormones. So oxytocin is at the top and you share that when you lecture on stage, I've seen you do that a lot yeah. and you love oxytocin. So I what love are your, yep. yeah, what I are do. your, favorite ways to get oxytocin? Well, I'm a touch person, so I'm a hugger. I definitely like hugs. Um, and I love petting my dog. Um, and I, I'm a verbal processor. I love connecting with people through, you know, through communication, um, you know, oral communication, just talking things through. And um, I have a lot of friends that are verbal processors too. So I know when we get together, that there is an oxytocin lift that really regulates all my hormones. Mm. So, and then the other, the other way I like to get oxytocin is nature. Um, and I think getting out into nature immediately puts me in an oxytocin state. Um, to your uh, vitamin G idea, mm -hmm. you know, it, the gratitude. I spend 20 minutes every morning in gratitude. Um, you know, really taking 20 minutes to think of all the things I'm grateful for so that I start the day with oxytocin. And, and again, we just don't prioritize this enough. And when you look at the hormones, we should be prioritizing this. This is not woo-woo. This is something that is really important that we bring back community because it will help balance women's hormones for sure, but also men. Ah, so important. Uh, you're right. A lot of it, it, it's overlooked with a lot of people. They hear it and they're like, yeah, that sounds cool. But really when you do it on a consistent basis, you're going to notice and experience the amazing benefits of getting this oxytocin release. And as you know, of course, Mindy, when you, your ovaries shut down, the adrenals pick up the slack. So that's really an important time in your book. You talk about that to really focus on these um, oxytocin moments in your life and gratitude. Vitamin G is one of the, my favorite ways to do so. There's always something to be grateful for, Mindy. Always. Always. Um, agreed. Always. You know, there's 150,000 people die every single day. Just knowing that stat and knowing that you're alive and breathing, that in itself is something to be grateful for. Just the, yeah. the fact that we're alive and breathing, the chances of us being born is 400 trillion to one. Like, how incredible is that? You know, it's just yeah, so amazing. amazing.
Yeah. It's amazing. And we don't give it enough. And this is, again, back to why I want to bring the feminine back to healthcare is there's awe, you know, in, in, uh, in an appreciation in how our bodies work. Whereas in uh, the more masculine version of healthcare, we look at symptoms as something that needs to be medicated. And in the feminine version of healthcare, we look at our own internal power. And one of the things we know about that is that gratitude has this hormonal effect on us. And so that's why I put it in there. I was like, we can't lose sight of that. It's so important. I love it. I, lo I love that we both share the, the the understanding that these symptoms are a gift from the innate intelligence. It's like, thank God we have these symptoms. Let's find out what's causing it. Why is this check engine light on? It's not something you mask and ignore and medicate, it's something you explore and it's an opportunity. So I love that. And a couple more things here, because I know you're losing your voice. This is your 400. <laughs> I've had a lot of podcasts, but I, I'm here for you, Ben. I've had a lot of podcasts. Interviews. There's a couple of things I still want to cover. So yeah, thank go you, for it. Um, in your book, you talk about uh, glycemic loads matter. And I love that. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, doing keto is, is a great way to control glycemic variability. But if you could dive a little bit deeper into what exactly that means and what are your favorite ways for understanding and testing your glycemic uh, load? Yeah. Um, you know, this is where diets have really failed us. So in the book, I have the five failed uh, diet uh, strategies we've applied. And one of them is, is that we've forgotten how important the glycemic index is. So a great example of this is the diet food you find in your market. You know, even if it's got NutraSweet in it, NutraSweet can spike blood sugar. So um, you really need to know what these foods are doing to your blood, blood sugar. And the best way to know, you know, you can go look up the glycemic index. You can look like take a banana and go and type in the glycemic index of a banana and you can learn, but, um, really a CGM or some kind of blood sugar reader is the best bet to know what glycemic the, uh, load of the food is and how your body's taking it in. So I feel like, um, we we have lost sight of the fact that different foods have different glycemic um, impacts. And so you want to get to know what foods impact you. So I'll give you an example. When I first wore a CGM, when I ate protein, my, my blood sugar spiked. But then after I'd been fasting for a long period of time, a couple of years, I, the, I put another CGM on. And I would eat a big thing of protein and my blood sugar would drop. So why was that? And it was changes in the microbiome, healthy mitochondria. So we need to get to know our food and how it impacts our, our glycemic index, which is just really our blood sugar. Yeah, so important. A CGM is a terrific tool, continuous yeah. glucose monitor. And if you can't get that, because uh, it's out of your price range or whatever, you know, getting just like a finger prick, those are very affordable to just really understand. You you would test before you break your fast and then an hour after eating, two hours after eating, understanding what that postprandial glucose looks like. It's just so important. It's not something you have to do forever. Just get a good understanding and yeah, uh, you great. can biohack your, your health in that aspect. So I think that is super important. In your book, you also have a whole bunch of recipes. How did you come up with those recipes? Did you design them yourself or did you work with somebody on that? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's a mishmash of home recipes. Um, and we hired somebody to make, there's 50 recipes in there. Uh, the chef that we hired made 25 of them. They're really good. And then we put our tried and true 25 in that we use all the time. And part of what I really wanted to put into the book was Break, breaking your fast recipes, like what would it look like to break your fast? So I, we put some examples uh, of that. I have a concept I call the three Ps, polyphenol, probiotic, and prebiotic foods. I think it's a great fast, a great way to break your fast. And we've got some smoothies in there, which is a good entry into your eating window. Um, and we've got some, you know, some chia pudding and things like that, that are, that yes, you can break your fast with and it's a health food. Yeah, that looks good. And I love how when you, in, in the chapters that you were talking about, like the three Ps or healthy fats, you also have bullet points of your favorite, you know, polyphenols, favorite probiotics and prebiotics and your favorite fats and very easy to understand and read. And you could just kind of just take that to your grocery store and that's yeah. what you should be eating. There's also a really a, a good, uh, heavy focus and we're not, we won't get into this now. We've gotten into it in the past, but there's a good focus on 
environmental toxins and the role of that. I, I, I know that you cannot leave that out because that's no. all what we're about. So yeah. it's just a, a comprehensive, uh, incredible book. What, what are you most proud about when it comes to this book, Mindy? Oh, I think I'm the most proud that we finally have a fasting manual for women. Um, it, you know, it's a combination of six different length fasts. So no, yeah. no book out there has six different length fasts. It's also, you know, the work I've been doing for the last seven years, answering YouTube questions, watching what works for women as they apply the different fasting techniques. So I'm, I, you know, it's those women on my YouTube channel, on Instagram, my resetter group and Facebook, like those are the women that gave me feedback and we were able to see what, what was going on. So I feel like this is really not just my words. This is a collective um, um, accumulation of, of what women are experienced with fasting and every question I've ever had, what I've seen work, what I haven't seen work. So it was just, you know, I, I was telling somebody the other day that I, you know, when Will Cole and Dave Asprey came out with their books, this was a couple of years ago, Dave did a whole chapter on, um, women. And I was like, okay, good job, Dave. This is awesome. And when I read the chapter, there was no real explanation of how women should fast differently. It was just that, you know, women should fast differently. And then Will Cole came out and said, well, we need to be intuitive with our fasting, um, which is definitely a feminine part of fasting for sure. Um, but there was no book that, you know, had these six different fasts. So what Hay House saw was that they that we needed a go-to manual for women. And, you know, uh, Cynthia did a great job with her book on 16.8. Um, but now what happens if a woman wants to go longer? Like, what do we do? So we really needed this manual. So I think I'm the most proud of the fact that women needed it. And what I was concerned about was that women would shy away from fasting. Their doctors would tell them they shouldn't fast. And I wanted to explain all the reasons why fasting like a girl is actually going to balance your hormones. Mm, you did a great job. And I'm, I'm super proud of yep. it. I'm super proud of you, Mindy. Where, where is the best and, place for my audience to get your book? Uh, you can go to fastlikeagirl.com. And, um, you know, we've been telling people, go to your local book sh shop if you can. Yeah. Um, on, on fastlikeagirl.com, you'll see bookshop.org and it'll tell you your independent book bookstore. Um, let's keep those bookstores alive. Um, so if you have the ability to order from, from them, that would be amazing, but you'll see all the bonuses we've been giving away and, um, all the different places you can get it. Awesome. We'll, we'll put that down below. We'll put Mindy's YouTube go subscribe to Mindy's YouTube, go subscribe to her Resetters podcast. And um, Mindy's website is drmindypels.com at doctor. I think it's your Instagram is dr.mindypels. I think yeah. it is. Yeah, dr.mindypels. You know it better than me. <laughs> um, That's good. Mindy, last question is re regarding vitamin G. Um, what are you grateful for right now? Hmm. You know, I, I think I'm really grateful for the number of women that rallied around this book. Um, Hay House, when we presented it to them the in the offer letter, they said to me, we, we see your mission and we want to be on it with you. Um, my agent, same thing, just really excited about what this could do for women's health. What about the, the biggest compliment you ever got in your life? It was the biggest compliment I ever got in my life. It Share was it. Yeah. It was really cool. Like I felt heard because, you know, there's a lot of reasons to write a book. Uh, as you know, writing a book is hard and um, it tests you. And yet I knew how important it was that women had this book. So to have the support of, of Hay House, my agent, the editors, like mostly women, um, it was really, really powerful. And I, I'm so grateful for it because they even to now, you know, to this day, they're, they're super excited about the book. They, we're going to do a three day water fast. Um, we're going to cool. combine communities with Hay House. Um, so cool. the first week of January, we're going to do a three day water fast where I lead people through, um, the people that buy the book can, I'll lead them through the three day water fast. So it was really Reed Tracy, the CEO of, of Hay House. That was his idea. And I'm like, great. Are you going to join me Reed? And he's like, yep. 
So it's Brilliant. really cool. We've got the whole Hay House community. I've got some doctors that are joining with their community. I'm bringing my community. You're more than welcome to bring your community. And, yes, the, and it's please. really a celebration of fasting. When is that? Is it week uh, of the release? Yeah, Janu- uh, January 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Oh, the first week of January. Okay, first week it. of January. What can, yeah. where, is there a website to learn more about that? It's or? on fastlikeagirl.com. Okay, there you go, yeah. fastlikeagirl.com. Well, yeah. what, what I was referring to is the compliment that, uh, was it Reed told you about Louis, um, Louise oh, Hay? Oh, Louise Hay, yeah. Yeah, Did yeah it, that was really it. cool. So, so here's a little backstory on that. Um, I've been reading Hay House books forever, and I know you're a book reader and you've yeah. been following Bob Proctor and studying him, um, but I had chronic fatigue syndrome when I was in my early 20s. And it was really, I was really in a low point and I went to a bookstore and found an incredible book. Um, it was called Living in the Light and it was all about visualization. And I thought, okay, well, I can't get off the couch. I have chronic fatigue, but I can visualize. And the more I visualize, the more my body got healthier and healthier. It's a little bit like Joe Dispenza's story. Yeah. And so I became really interested in this idea that the body can heal itself and Hay House has that thread throughout so many of their books. And that was a main message of Louise Hay. So when I met with Reed, I said, you know, women are feeling unheard. Um, women are tired of one size fits all. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to give women a resource in this book that they, that they haven't been given. And he was super complimentary. And then a week later, out went an email to all of Hay House saying that he was so moved by his discussion with me and that Louise Hay would have loved me. Mm. And, you know, that was, that was the highest compliment because Hay House books healed me. Um, books in general have changed my life. And so to be a part of a mission-based publisher like this just lights me up. So beautiful. Well, full circle. I love that. Totally full circle. Mindy, I appreciate you so very much. Um, appreciate you, you. you. You inspire me all the time. Uh, you're so much fun to be around. Your energy is contagious. This book is going to be such a game changer. It's going to change, I believe, millions of lives uh, when we look back at it. And I'm just, I'm excited and grateful to know you and continue Thank to learn you. from you. And one more thing I forgot to mention that Mindy is joining my um, next Keto Challenge, which is coming up January 9th. Mindy's awesome. a featured speaker. Uh, you can learn more about that over at ketocampchallenge.com. We have Dr. Mindy Pels. We have Dr. Pampa, Dr. Boz, and Megan Ramos. So that's going to be an ex- This is your third one, the third challenge you've Yeah, won. and, and <laughs> that's going to be a really good discussion. Oh, uh, I can't wait. So excited so that you're pulling fun. those people together. I love you, Mindy. Thank you for the work love that you, you do. And thank you so much for inspiring yeah, me on a daily basis. Thank and you. congratulations on the book. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate all your support and thank you for all the work you're doing in the world. It's, it's, it's lonely, right? When you're out like trying to change healthcare and when you know you've got a brother in the cause, it really yeah, makes it yeah. so much more enjoyable. So I appreciate you and love you. So grateful. Thank you,